Do you know what the realm is? It's the thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agree to tell each other over and over till we forget that it's a lie. What's up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for another A Song of Ice and Fire video. In one of my recent videos, I went over Ned Stark's first chapter in the book, A Game of Thrones. During that video, I highlighted some of the evidence from the chapter that I believe shows who is next in line for the Iron Throne. As you all know, after Viserys dies, we are led to believe Daenerys is the only other Targaryen in the line of succession, but we eventually find out Jon Snow has a legitimate claim as well. This was confirmed in the Game of Thrones television show. Now, I think most of us believe this will also happen in the books. However, there are a lot of fans who think this was only done for the show. Some of the A Song of Ice and Fire fans say Jon Snow is not the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna. Now, I don't agree with that at all, so I thought I would make this video for everyone who hasn't read the books. I want to show you all the references I found that I think indicates Jon Snow is the next one in line for the throne. I hope you find some of these references as interesting as I did, because George R. R. Martin is a genius at hiding these right under our nose. In fact, George R. R. Martin is so good at this, I might have missed some, but I think I will show you more than enough evidence to back it up. Shall we begin? Now, there is a very good chance that Bran Stark could become the final king of Westeros in the books, like he did in the show. However, that does not mean he is the next one in line. If this happens in the books, it will most likely be because Jon isn't able to, for whatever reason. The secrets to some of the biggest mysteries in A Song of Ice and Fire were most likely laid out to us in the very first book. I think some of the most interesting details were even laid out to us in some of the very first chapters. For those of you who did not see my last video, this is set up for us in Ned Stark's first chapter, when Robert Baratheon arrives in Winterfell. As Robert and Ned are heading down to see Lyanna's statue, Robert talks about how he barely noticed anyone outside as he made his journey north. Ned says everyone was most likely too shy to come out to see their king. Then he says, kings are a rare sight in the north. Robert then says, more likely they were hiding under the snow. Now you could take this at face value, but if you read between the lines, you will see that George R. R. Martin is slowly revealing Jon Snow's secret. Right after Ned says kings are a rare sight in the north, Robert says more likely they were hiding under the snow. I think that means there is a king in the north hiding under the name Snow, as in Jon Snow. It's no coincidence this is said right as Robert and Ned are on their way to see Lyanna. Ned was able to hide this secret right under everyone's nose by hiding him under the name Snow. That might not mean very much to you by itself, but let's see what else we can find. In Jon Snow's first chapter, he has a conversation with his uncle Benjen about joining the Night's Watch. Benjen doesn't want Jon to give up everything in his life right away. He essentially says Jon is still too young to make that decision. Jon says, Daron Targaryen was only 14 when he conquered Dorne. The young dragon was one of his heroes. His uncle Benjen reminds him that Daron also died by the age of 18. Now this might not mean that much at first either, but I find it very interesting that George R. R. Martin wrote this in Jon's very first chapter. We can see that Jon has a connection to a Targaryen who was able to achieve things at a very young age, just like Jon. But then he ended up dead at a very young age, just like Jon as well. The young dragon is one of Jon's heroes, while Jon might also be a young dragon himself. Now let's look at something from Tyrion Lannister's second chapter. When Jon and Tyrion are on their way to the Wall together, they set up camp for the night to get some sleep. This is when Jon notices Tyrion is reading a book. It's a book that just so happens to be about dragons. And what makes this even more interesting is the fact that Tyrion might be a Targaryen as well. There is more than enough evidence to support that theory. And maybe I'll even make a video where I show all the evidence for Tyrion being a Targaryen. But for now, let's stick to Jon. As Tyrion is reading the book about dragons, he tells Jon, When I was your age, I used to dream of having a dragon of my own. Then he says, don't look at me that way, bastard. I know your secret. You have dreamt the same kind of dreams. I happen to feel like this is the author speaking directly to us. Jon is not the bastard we think we know. In Jon Snow's fourth chapter, he's at the wall. Jon and Sam are having a conversation about their dreams. Like we saw in the show, Sam tells Jon about how his father made him join the Night's Watch. 
Sam's father essentially tells him he's not welcome at home. This leads John to telling Sam about his dream, and how it left him feeling the same way. John says, The old kings of winter are down there, sitting on their throne with their stone wolves at their feet and iron swords across their laps. But it's not them I'm afraid of. I scream that I'm not a Stark, that this isn't my place, but it's no good. I have to go anyway, so I start down, feeling the walls as I descend, with no torch to light the way. Now at first, this may seem like John isn't welcome down there because he's a bastard. And as we all know, bastards do not get their own statues in the crypts of Winterfell. But I think it means more than just that. I think he's really not welcome down there because he's a Targaryen. But he still has this sense that he has to go down there anyway. And I think that's because although he is a Targaryen, his mother, Lyanna, is still down there below the castle. He has to find out the truth one way or another. Now the next one I want to show you was very well hidden. You would have to be looking very closely to spot it. This is when Sirio Pharrell has Arya chasing cats around the Red Keep in King's Landing. Right as Arya is chasing this cat, she runs into one of the gold cloaks from the City Watch. This is what it says. One by one, Arya had chased them down and snatched them up and brought them to Sirio Pharrell. All but this one. This one-eared black devil of a tomcat. That's the real king of this castle right there. One of the gold cloaks that told her, older than sin and twice as mean. One time, the king was feasting the queen's father, and that black bastard hopped up on the table and snatched a roast quail right out of Lord Tywin's fingers. Now actually think about what that gold cloak said. He referred to the cat as the real king of the castle and a black bastard. What character do we know that might be considered a black bastard, who also might be the real king of that castle in King's Landing? You would be right if you guessed Jon Snow. Jon is well known as a bastard, but since he is now in the Night's Watch, he is also known as a black brother, or a brother in black, or a man in black. He is a black bastard, who is the real king of the castle. The way this was woven in here as just another throwaway line is genius. Let's go ahead and move on to another one of Ned Stark's chapters. This is when Littlefinger takes Ned to see who Jon Arryn spoke to before he died. It was the mother of one of Robert Baratheon's bastards. If you remember from the show, Littlefinger takes Ned to see her in his brothel. This is when Ned is realizing all of Robert's bastards have black hair, unlike his so-called children by Cersei. This scene is different in the books, because now we get to see Ned Stark's thoughts as it's happening. What he thinks about is very interesting. The mother of Robert's child says, Tell Robert how beautiful she is. I will, Ned had promised her. He then thought of the promises he made Lyanna as she lay dying, and the price he paid to keep them. I will tell him, child, and I promise you, Bara shall not go wanting. She had smiled then, a smile so tremulous and sweet that it cut the heart right out of him. Riding through the rainy night, Ned saw Jon Snow's face in front of him, so like a younger version of his own. This is not a coincidence either. Right after Ned thinks of Lyanna, he can see Jon Snow's face. This is obviously because Lyanna reminds him of Jon. They have those stark features just like Ned. Why else would Ned be thinking about the promise he made Lyanna right as he's looking at one of Robert's bastards who also has to be kept in the shadows? Ned thinks about all this because he had to do the same thing with Jon, and that's why he sees his face right after he ends the conversation. Now what makes it even more interesting is what Ned thinks about next. After he thinks about Lyanna and Jon, he then thinks about Rhaegar. Imagine that. It says, For the first time in years, he found himself remembering Rhaegar Targaryen. He wondered if Rhaegar had frequented in the brothels, but somehow he thought not. You see, Lyanna's death was such a traumatic event in Ned Stark's life that he actually doesn't remember a whole lot from that day. He does remember what happened leading up to her death, but once he's holding her lifeless body, he doesn't really remember much after that. He has been able to block it out. But the sight of Robert's bastard has Ned remembering things he hasn't thought of in years. All of this reminds him of what happened the day he found Lyanna inside a tower in Dorne. This makes him think of Jon and Rhaegar as well. And we all know why. Let's look at another one. This is from the second book of Clash of Kings. In one of Jon's chapters, he and Lord Commander Mormont have a conversation about Maester Aemon's life. As you all know, John figures out that Maester Aemon is a Targaryen, so Lord Commander Mormon talks to him about this and some of the recent Targaryen kings. Neither of them have any idea that John is actually related to all of them, 
and he is the next one in line for that Iron Throne. Anyways, John and his Lord Commander talk about Maester Aemon's father, and his brothers, and the Mad King. But then, once again, something very interesting happens. Lord Commander Mormont says, Jaime Lannister ended the line of Dragon Kings when he killed the Mad King. In the books, Lord Commander Mormont has a raven, and during this conversation, his raven croaks the word King. Then the raven flapped across the solar to land on Mormont's shoulder. King, it said again, strutting back and forth. He likes that word, John said, smiling. Mormont stroked the raven under the beak with a finger, but all the while his eyes never left Jon Snow. Now actually think about that. Right as they are having a conversation about the different Targaryen kings and how they were all dead, Mormont's raven locks his eyes on Jon Snow and says the word king over and over again, without his eyes ever leaving Jon. Now we all know the Three-Eyed Crow is inside that raven, and we all know the Three-Eyed Crow knows everything. He's letting us know who the real king is after all. This is George R. R. Martin's way of speaking directly to us, but also leaving it somewhat open because some will say it's a bird that doesn't know anything. Let's have another look from one of John's chapters. This is said when John and Yigurd are together. After she finds out John is the bastard of Winterfell, she tells him a story that has a very obvious connection to his own. This is what it says. Bail the Bard made it, said Yigurd. He was king beyond the wall a long time back. All the free folk know his songs, but might be you don't sing them in the south. The Stark in Winterfell wanted Bale's head, but never could take him, and the taste of failure galled him. One day in his bitterness, he called Bale a craven who preyed only on the weak. When word of that got back, Bale vowed to teach the Lord a lesson. So he scaled the wall, skipped down the King's Road, and walked into Winterfell one winter's night with his harp in hand, naming himself Sigurik of Skagos. Sigurik means deceiver in the old tongue, that the first men spoke and the giants still speak. North or south, singers always find a ready welcome, so Bale ate at the Lord Stark's own table and played for the Lord in his high seat until half the night was gone. It's said that he played and sang so well that when he was done, the Lord offered to let him name his own reward. All I ask for is a flower, Bale answered, the fairest flower that blooms in the gardens of Winterfell. So the Stark sent to his glass gardens and commanded that the most beautiful of winter roses be plucked for the singer's payment. And so it was done. But when the morning come, the singer had vanished, and so had Lord Brandon's maiden daughter. Her bed they found empty, but for the pale blue rose that Bale had left on the pillow where her head had lain. John had never heard this tale before. Lord Brandon had no other children. For most a year, they searched for any sign of Bale or this maid till the Lord lost heart and took to his bed, and it seemed as though the line of Starks was at its end. But one night as he was lay waiting to die, Lord Brandon heard a child's cry. He followed the sound and found his daughter back in her bedchamber, asleep with a babe at her breast. They had been in Winterfell all the time, hiding with the dead beneath the castle. The maid loved Bale so dearly she bore him a son, the song says. Now let's look at the connections here because this story sounds very similar to Rhaegar, Lyanna, and Jon's. Bael the Bard could play the harp very well, just like Rhaegar. Bael the Bard asks the Lord of Winterfell for a blue winter rose that he ends up giving to the daughter of Winterfell. This is the same kind of blue rose Rhaegar gave Lyanna at the tourney of Harrenhal. Then Bael the Bard and her disappeared, and they had a son together. This is what Rhaegar and Lyanna did as well. And this son ends up becoming the Bastard of Winterfell, just like Jon Snow. It's no coincidence that when we learn of this story, it's in Jon Snow's chapter. Now, sometime after Ygritte tells Jon this story, he begins to question who he really is. In another one of Jon's chapters, this is what it says. I never meant to steal you, he said. I never knew you were a girl until my knife was at your throat. If you kill a man and never meant, he's just as dead, Ygritte said stubbornly. Jon had never met anyone so stubborn, except maybe for his little sister Arya. Is she still my sister? He wondered. Was she ever? Well, John, the answer is no. Now, you could obviously look at this a few different ways, but I happen to believe George R. R. Martin is guiding us in a certain direction with John's storyline. This next one I want to show you is most likely foreshadowing two different things. Let's look at the prologue in A Dance with Dragons. Now, this chapter is from the perspective of Varamir Sixskins, who is a member of the Free Folk who knows how to skin change into several different animals. He's more or less the zookeeper out beyond the wall. 
Well, in this chapter, Vermeer has been stabbed and he knows he's about to die. So, he looks for someone or something to skin change into so his conscience can live on in something else. As he is thinking about what he will do next, he begins to think about Jon Snow and his direwolf ghost. This is what it says. He had known what Snow was the moment he saw that great white direwolf stalking silent at his side. One skin changer can always sense another. Man should have let me take the direwolf. There would be a second life worthy of a king. He could have done it, he did not doubt. The gift was strong in Snow, but the youth was untaught, still fighting his nature when he should have gloried in it. Now I want you to focus on this one line when Varamir says, there would be a second life worthy of a king. Alright, for those of you that haven't read the books, you might not know this, but Jon Snow is able to skin change into Ghost, just like Bran does with Summer. All of the Stark children have that ability in the books. Since Varamir is a skin changer, he's able to sense the same ability in Jon, and he notices this while Jon and Mance are together. This chapter is foreshadowing what Jon will have to do once he dies at the end of this book. This is shortly before Jon is stabbed by his own men at the Night's Watch. Right before Jon dies, he will have to go inside Ghost, then eventually go back inside his own body if it can be saved through magic or something else. Varamir's six skins not only foreshadows what Jon will have to do when he dies, but he also foreshadows Jon's biggest secret when he thinks there would be a second life worthy of a king. As we all know, Ghost is not your average wolf. Varamir thinks Ghost is so special, only a king is worthy of skin changing into him for a second life. He's actually right. Jon Snow is a secret king, and he will use ghosts for a second life, at least for a short period of time. Now I want to look at what Maester Aemon said to Jon when they last spoke. He gave Jon some final advice, and this is what he said. Egg had an innocence to him, a sweetness we all loved. Kill the boy within you, I told him the day I took ship for the wall. It takes a man to rule. An egg on, not an egg. Kill the boy and let the man be born. The old man felt John's face. You are half the age that egg was, and your own burden is a crueler one, I fear. You will have little joy of your command, but I think you have the strength in you to do the things that must be done. Kill the boy, John Snow. Winter is almost upon us. Kill the boy and let the man be born. Maester Aemon can obviously sense something within John. Something that reminds him of Aegon. This makes the second time Maester Aemon gave that advice. He gave it to one Aegon many years ago. Then right before he dies, he feels the need to give it again to another Aegon Targaryen. Well, Jon's real name was Aegon Targaryen in the show, but it might be slightly different in the book. Either way, I don't think this is a coincidence. Now, if there is only one reference to Jon being a king, or one instance of Jon having a connection to a Targaryen, then I could easily dismiss it as a coincidence, but this happens in every single book. There has to be a good reason why. The author is telling us something. Alright, now this next one was a little harder to find. You will have to read between the lines to see it. At the beginning of Game of Thrones, Robert Baratheon is the king of Westeros. And before Robert Baratheon became king, there was Aerys Targaryen, also known as the Mad King, who ran the Seven Kingdoms. Robert Baratheon was known as a drunk, and the Mad King was known as a madman. Let me show you what I mean. In A Dance with Dragons, it says, Barristan Selmy could not dispute that. He had spent the best part of his own life obeying the commands of drunkards and madmen. Obviously, Barristan was a member of the King's Guard for Robert and the Mad King. We hear Tywin Lannister make the same reference in the show. He says to Jaime, You served as a glorified bodyguard for two kings, one a madman, the other a drunk. What have you done with these blessings, huh? You've served as a glorified bodyguard for two kings. One a madman, the other a drunk. Now let's look at something very interesting from one of John's chapters. It says, John laughed. Laughed like a drunk or a madman, and his men laughed with him. This is another example of George R. R. Martin hiding the secret right under our nose. Now, John might not be a drunk or a madman, but he does have a connection to the Mad King and Robert Baratheon. He is, and or will be, a king just like them. Let me show you something else. From A Clash of Kings, when Jon meets Gilly at Craster's Keep. This is when Gilly is looking for some help. It says, Her breath frosted the air in small nervous puffs. They say the king gives justice and protects the weak. 
She started to climb off the rock, awkwardly, but the ice had made it slippery and her foot went out from under her. John caught her before she could fall and helped her safely down. The woman knelt on the icy ground. Alright, now let's look at this a little closer. Gilly says, the king gives justice and he protects the weak. This is immediately followed up by John saving Gilly from hitting the ground. He protects the weak. When he does this for Gilly, it says she kneels down on the icy ground. She kneels before him, as if he's a king. Now maybe this is nothing at all, or maybe it means John is a king, who does what one should. Okay, now let's look at one more that I want to show you, and I think this one is very interesting as well. In order to see this, first we have to look at one of Davos's chapters. It says, The Lady Melisandre tells us sometimes R'hllor permits his faithful servants to glimpse the future and the flames. It seemed to me as I watched the fire this morning that I was looking at a dozen beautiful dancers, maidens garbed in yellow silk, spinning and swirling before a great king. I think it was a true vision, sir. A glimpse of the glory that awaits his grace after we take King's Landing and the throne that is his by right. Now make sure you remember what he saw in the fire. He was able to see beautiful maiden dancers garbed in yellow, swirling and spinning in front of a great king. Let's see what it says Jon Snow sees later in the same book. It says, Jon went out to cut more branches, snapping each in two before tossing it into the flames. The tree had been dead a long time, but it seemed to live again in the fire, as fiery dancers woke within each stick of the wood to whirl and spin in their glowing gowns of yellow, red, and orange. Now you can see what great king this was happening in front of. Sir Axel Florent was not able to see the king's face, but he could see the dancers wearing yellow, spinning around in the fire. Then, as John looked in those flames, it seemed as if the fire was dancing and spinning in yellow, red, and orange right in front of him. This is fascinating stuff, ladies and gentlemen. As I said before at the beginning of the video, Bran Stark may become the king like he did in the show, but we all know who the rightful king really is, and that is Jon motherfreaking Snow. Leave me your thoughts down below. I have a bunch of different videos in the works, so make sure you are on the lookout for those. I will be releasing videos more frequently now that I have all the new equipment that I needed. I am very excited, so I hope to see you all back here for those videos as well. As always, I want to thank everyone for watching this video, and I also want to thank everyone for supporting me on Patreon. Have a great day. I will see you again very soon. Bye.